next and last speaker is Mary Olson. She is the founder and director of the Gender and Radiation Impact Project called GRIP. GRIP is dedicated to education and expanding understanding of the disproportionate harm from exposure to ionizing radiation suffered by the biological female body compared to the biological male. Olson made an original independent finding on gender differences in cancer rates in 2011 while working as a staff biologist for the Nuclear Information and Resource Service. Her training is in evolutionary biology, and her current goal is to spur institutions of excellence to pursue many research questions, not the least being why biological sex is a factor in radiation harm. Thank you, Mary Olson, for joining us today. Take it away. Thank you so much for having me. I'm going to share my screen to have some slides. Um, hopefully I can do this quickly. Okay, um, I think these are all gonna be posted. So if I'm moving fairly quickly, I put the links in so that you have them from uh, posting. So we've been talking about radiation, ionizing radiation. It is invisible, but we can see the harm it does to chromosomes. And each of these different types of damage is what we're going to be talking about. If a reproductive cell is damaged, deformation is one outcome. However, much more common is catastrophic damage, which prevents reproduction altogether. And it may be prior to fertilization in the ova or spermatogonia, or it may be um, once fertilization occurs, often so early in pregnancy that it only shows up in our awareness as infertility. And I think that's a big clue people should be uh, spending a lot more time studying is infertility rates in high radiation exposure areas. However, our soma, our body, the somatic impacts are what we're mostly going to focus on when talking about at least half of this talk. So in this picture, we see the radiation coming in on the left side. When it hits a living cell, one of the primary types of damage is to the DNA, as Arnie said. If you have a, a particle or a wave of radiation, it can actually break the DNA. Now, our body has repair mechanisms one of which is to simply absorb a dying cell if the cell is damaged to that point. So the problem is when there's cellular damage, DNA damage that is not fully repaired or not repaired correctly, that may over time, not in every case, become a malignancy, a cancer, and, and cause the terrible suffering that we see every day. This is just a nod to Arnie Gunderson, who you've heard, and also Dr. Ian Fairley, who he referenced. These are the links to that um, podcast, and they have certainly taught me a lot of what I know about tritium, and I count as good friends in life. Uh, this slide uh, is split in half. On the left side is a picture that shows that different types of ionizing radiation penetrate to different degrees. And beta particles go about a centimeter in water or in flesh. They, they're not penetrating the way gamma and fast neutrons are. And that is part of why our regulators dismiss them, because in the work environment, they are thought to be no big deal. Unfortunately, once they get inside our body, if the radioactive emission, that beta particle, happens inside our bodies, then the outcomes are very different. Now, the slide on the right just basically shows that water, which we've already heard, radioactive hydrogen can form a water molecule and move through our environment, or it can stay as a gas and move through our environment and be taken up by plants and animals, which become our food. Unlike some other radionuclides, however, they don't concentrate as, as many times as some of the metals do, but this is how we get the internal exposures, is through breathing, drinking, and eating. So we saw Arnie make a beautiful little uh, water molecule with his hand. Here are water molecules linked together with the hydrogen bonds. Any of those hydrogens can be radioactive tritium. And as Arnie said, the half-life is 12.33 years, but that's only half of the material is gone in that amount of time. 
And we're going to talk about gone in a second. The hazardous period is 10 to 20 times that. So 120 to 220 years is where you can still find traces of any release of tritium still in the environment. So half goes in 12.33 years, half goes of what's left at that point in another 12.33 years and on down through time, you still have traces even a couple hundred years into the future. Now this water cycle picture is why dilution is viewed as the solution. And I'm gonna hurry on to another slide after this one that tells you why that doesn't really apply to tritium. In part, the concern is the binding of tritium to something besides water. This is because when that particle, the beta particle comes out, the tritium isn't tritium anymore. It decays to helium. And so if in our food or our drinking water, the tritium has become bound into uh, someplace like the DNA, when that beta comes flying out, it can break the DNA strands nearby, but the tritium atom itself is now gone. And the chemical properties of the next element in the decay chain, this one is the final element, just one step in this decay chain, is helium. And helium's chemical properties are completely different. Now, this one the regulator never talks about what happens to the biochemistry as decay occurs. We don't have any studies that I'm aware of that can tell you this story. We need to know it because here's the key thing. Tritium doesn't concentrate through a food chain, but it goes everywhere. Just like it can't be filtered out of the fuel pool, it can't be filtered by the blood-brain barrier. It goes right into places where only water can go. And that is into our brains. Blood doesn't go there, water goes there. It carries the nutrients to the brain. And if it's radioactive water, it brings those beta particle emissions right in. And the second place that the water goes that nothing else can go is across the placental barrier. If a woman is pregnant, the placenta is there to protect the developing embryo and uterus, um, fetus, excuse me, misspoke, the developing embryo and fetus. And the International Commission on Radiological Protection, the global body called the ICRP, acknowledges that because the fetus is growing, the um, radioactivity, the hydrogen, collects there twice as fast as in the maternal tissue. So as I've said, it can get bound, it can go into proteins, it can go into nucleic acids, including DNA, and the bound tritium stays in the body about twice as long as radioactive water, because in addition to a half-life, you have a biological half-life. Water doesn't stay in your body for 12.33 years. It generally moves through in a couple of weeks but the bound tritium stays about twice as long and therefore can give about twice the level of radiation exposure. And because it stays longer, it's more likely to decay and cause that biochemical chaos that I just mentioned. So we talked about, Arnie mentioned, how does it get out of a reactor? I'm going to direct you to Dr. Ian Fairley's work on the opening of the reactor vessel. It's a tremendously important piece that Indian Point no longer has. Other reactors that are still operating do have and is really important. Um, but I'm going to jump now because I was asked to talk about the disproportionate impact on female bodies, and that's not a beta emitter finding. It's a gamma and neutron finding. And so I can't talk about it in terms of this fuel pool question in the Hudson River. I need to take you to the original source material because unfortunately no institution of excellence has yet picked up the research questions associated with these, these findings. But it's in the NAS, Biological Effects of Ionizing Radiation uh, or BEER-7 report is where the numbers that I looked at are. 
and they correspond to 60 years of tracking the survivors of Hiroshima and Nagasaki in the 1945 US attack on Japan with the very first nuclear weapons. And I just have to say that it rends my heart every time these are people's lives. This picture is not a picture of a nuclear bomb. This is a picture of Hiroshima, the city itself, moments before it was a city and now it's a cloud. So I'm just gonna whip right through this because we're short on time. Um, I'd love to come back and talk more about these findings, where exactly they come from. But we knew way back then that radiation was more harmful to children. There are many reasons for this, but the primary is that children's bodies are growing. And when they're growing, the DNA is uh, more vulnerable. It's the cells are dividing more frequently. And so radiation has a greater impact uh, during those processes. So we knew that children would be more impacted by exposure to radiation. And this is now the flash of gamma and neutrons that came out of the A-bombs in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. About 100,000 survivors were in the tracking, and this is 60 years later. They were grouped by the age they were at the, in August 1945 in five-year age cohorts. And I looked at the numbers of cancer incidents that came out from tracking them. And interestingly, they were disaggregated by uh, biological sex, by girls and boys, men and women. And the big news, big, big news, is that those who were children in 1945 and suffered that radiation exposure we knew they were going to have the most cancer, but what we didn't know is that the girls would have twice as much compared to the boys over 60 years. We don't show here the age they were when the cancer arrived. It's across the next 60 years. And for girls to have twice as much cancer outcome than boys, if you're doing any type of biological research, this is a showstopper. So I really hope the institutions of excellence are going to take this one up and, and answer the question why. We don't know why. But we do know that the effect persists across all the age groups. Every single group of females had more cancer than did males in the same age group. And this is now cancer death. When these people were exposed as adults, for every two men who died of cancer, three women died of cancer. And this is a bar chart, which I don't have time to explain how it's constructed. It is an extraction of the data imagining as if everybody had the same radiation exposure so that you can compare the age and uh, the biological sex. But you can see that the blue line being males and the red line being females, there is a difference in every age group. Females had more uh, cancer across the boards and the difference is greatest in young children. So the last comment is simply that girls are not a subpopulation. That's how EPA talks about all this. And NRC just uses a reference man, doesn't talk about girls or women at all in any of its regulations. But girls are an inextricable link in the human life cycle. And until we protect the human life cycle, we are not providing protection. Mm -hmm.